Well, if you're not alive, you're dead. Systems are alive or dead. Alive <laughs> or offline. We like to um, a more for um, an what's the term? Um, anthropomorphize. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So dead, dead system. <laughs> We're now talking about dead system analysis, and uh, in fact, I'm going to keep this sweet and brief because. Everything that you guys have learnt about in the forensic side of things all applies basically the same way. Um, all the stuff that Emlyn has you know, done an excellent job of explaining to you guys, that's basically what you can do. Probably not using the same software for practical reasons, but you're going to basically be doing the same thing. You're looking at the stuff that's sitting on a hard drive to figure out what happened. So, you know, why would we take a computer offline? Well, you know, as we were just saying, we, we want to prevent further modification. So if we've got an attacker that's hacked into our system, they might be altering log files. Hopefully we've got them on a remote system, but maybe we don't. They might be modifying all sorts of files on that computer, maybe installing rootkits and all sorts of things, making it difficult for us to figure out what happened. Um, we might, you know, obviously taking them offline is going to prevent them from doing further harm. So maybe they're going to be maybe they're currently accessing secret files, you know, confidential files that we've got on on the system. They might, you know, so we basically we can prevent further harm to the system, either integrity or confidentiality side of things. Obviously, turning it off is not helping our availability goal of security, um, but you know we can stop them from achieving whatever their goals are. So if we're a bank and they've hacked into our system getting it offline as fast as possible is probably a good idea because you don't want them to give them the time to figure out how to give themselves more money, for example. Um, and you might not trust live analysis for all the reasons we were just <coughs> discussing because the processes running on that system might have been compromised and it might be lying to you. So if you take things offline, suddenly you're sa you feel a lot safer because now I trust all the, pro all the software that I'm using. I know that it's doing the right thing and I'm seeing exactly what's on this hard drive. So we figured out security incidents happened, we decided to take the system offline, you know, what do we ne do next? Basically, we're going to look at a few ways you can investigate what happened um, and minimize modification of evidence. So collecting the evidence, we might create a disk image of the hard, hard drive or the petition. So you, know, you guys know all about that, right? You're just making an exact copy of what was on a computer to a, a file that represents all the stuff that was on that hard drive, basically. You can use DD to do uh, like an exact byte for byte copy, um, which is a Unix command, or you can use forensic software like NCase or FTK or whatever, and that can create, it's more of a complex file format, but it's essentially the same thing, it's a copy of what was on the computer. Um, or we could just access the hard drive directly, we can just plug the hard drive in and look at it, right? It just depends how important it is to us that we don't modify the files. So um, if we were intending to pursue legal action, what would be the best approach? I, I block, I Create an image? Right blocker, then image. Right blocker, and then image. And then image it. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you, don't, you have no chance of changing anything. Yeah. Yeah, good. So as you say, write blockers. So you can use either hardware or software. It's going to prevent or limit the amount of write instructions that get sent to the device. So you can basically, you get these devices, which you guys know, and you basically can plug the hard drive into that and it's going to stop the accidental writes to the hard drive, basically, or, you know, otherwise. Um, now, if we're talking about security, so that's on the forensic side of things, obviously that's really important because you've got, you know, you know that you're taking it to court, you need to maintain a chain of evidence and all that sort of stuff and make sure you, you can make the argument that things haven't changed. If we're talking about a security professional as an incident response side of things, what do you think would happen? It means you can analyze the data that at, at the time of the attack instead of have allowing the, because if you uh, if mm. you don't right block it, it means it will change when you open it or otherwise, which means the information will be yes. there at the same state as it was to begin with instead of state afterwards. Yes, that's a good point. So if you don't use a right blocker and you just plug a hard drive in, it's going to change access times on the file system every time you access a file and that could basically be erasing evidence and make it harder to figure out what happened on the system. Yes, that's a very good point. So there are some good reasons to do it. 
Whether you would go to the point of using hardware to do it is probably less likely it's when we're... It's not as important in security as it is in forensics. Yeah. In foren yeah, yeah. So the, the, it's important, but not as important. So you're probably not going to find many people using write blockers with hardware, but you would do something in software to try and prevent it. So one answer to that is basically using read-only mounting. So you can basically mount a hard drive in a read-only state. And on Linux or Unix, it's super <coughs> easy. You just put it as a mount option, read only, and then the kernel won't send any write changes to the system. Well, or many hard drives you could use. Many. A, you could use, oh, I can't remember what they're called. Hmm. Jumper, you could, you could use a jumper on an old IDE hard drive to make it write only. Right, read only, you mean? Uh, read only, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you do that, then you can basically get access to the system by, you know, basically mounting it. Um, now you can either do the read-only mounting of the hard drive itself, so you just plug the hard drive in, mount it read-only, or you can mount an image as a loopback, a loop device. So you can have, if you've imaged the hard drive using DD, for example, you've just got a file sitting there, you can literally use the mount command tell it to read only and it's pointed at the image and then you can basically get access to everything that was sitting on that hard drive before that petition and you can like access it. So say we did do that and we're basically we just open up on our computer we're just browsing through the files and looking at what was on the computer what are the risks of accessing files from a computer that's been compromised? It may compromise the following computer because yeah. transference of data happens regardless. Yeah, we might accidentally compromise our investigation machine, right? So, for example, if there's some programs on there that have been compromised, there might be... Um, you opened it without yeah. realizing it <laughs> yeah. install onto the new computer. Exactly. And then you'd have to redo the process all over again. Yeah, exactly. So we might accidentally run a program or something, or we access a file that's designed to try and comp you know, cause a buffer overflow or whatever, and we end up compromising our investigation machine and... Um, you know, not great. But then again, there are some advantages of taking that approach because then we can use syst um, like existing file-based tools like Ar RK Hunter, which is like a rootkit detection system. You use SHA-SUM, so you use anti-malware software. So, so you may intentionally infect the investigation machine to discover well, information. We we will try and try and avoid getting in ac infecting the machine, but we've decided it's worth the risk. Plug and plug the hard drive in, and then we can do things like a virus scan on it, which you, obviously you can't do a virus scan on an NCASE file, as far as I'm aware. You need to mount it so that you, so that the virus scanner can access it as normal files. So there are some advantages of doing that, and that is not unusual. Uh, in fact, very very common. Uh, or we can do the disk-based analysis thing, where we basically use some specialist uh, incident response or um, forensic software tools. To access the files, so for example, like this picture in the, the background, you can basically see all the hex on the hard drive and all that sort of stuff. So that allows us to basically use some kind of graphical interface to interact with the, the information that's there, and we look at things like hex views of seeing what's not exactly as it's stored, and we can um, might have support for viewing certain types of file formats like images and things like that. Um, and it might be able to actually automate detecting some kind of um, evidence or something, um, and it might have some support for hash sets and things like that. So, um, you know, what do you think the advantages or disadvantages of using this kind of software for a security task would be? Anything you can think of? Well, yeah, you can't use a virus scanner, that's true. Very limited in the tools, the external tools you can use, so you're limited in what the software provides for you. Yeah. Advantages, same thing as we mentioned before, is we're not going to accidentally infect ourselves with a virus because it's not going to run a program, it's just going to show us the contents. So y you can basically use all of the skills that we've covered in this module so far on the evidence we've collected offline. So we can use log management stuff. So all the stuff we talked about the other, you know, a few weeks ago about looking at log files and understanding log files, you can look at them. You can do integrity management, which is really important for looking for files that have changed on the system you know you can um, but you know you can look at all these different things um, but it also ties into all the forensic stuff that you guys have learned in the forensics modules probably you're not going to 
like a, a corporation or an organization with a security net with a computer network probably not going to have a license for Encase, for example, because it's like quite expensive piece of software and you know good for for like forensic investigation, but probably not something that everyone would have access to. Um, so you might use different software like Autopsy or something, which is like a free open source alternative. Uh, and there are, you know, there's a few various pieces of software that you could use instead. Um, so the other sorts of things you can do is file type analysis, um, which is basically just looking at file headers and everything like that to detect uh, whether, you know, if you're looking for, for certain types of files. And you can do timeline analysis, right? Which uh, think have you covered that yet in? On the forensic side of things, if not, you will soon. Which is basically where you you look at all the contents of the hard drive, and you can build up this timeline of all the stuff that happened based on access times. So as you know, the file system on most computers remembers the last time a file was created, uh, accessed, and modified. And depending on whether it's Win Windows or Unix, slightly different information is stored. So on Unix, it's like whether the I nodes changed, and on Windows, it's like the creation date. But you can get access times. So if you look at the la last time something was ac each file was accessed, you can sort of build up this timeline of evidence of all the stuff that happened. So you can see that visually and you can say, oh, this file got accessed and then this file got accessed, you know, and you can see a picture of what happened. But, you know, from a security point of view, an attacker may have modified all of this stuff, right? So it's helpful for us to look at, and in forensics, probably you need to be less worried about this because most people aren't going to change these things on their computers but it's I guess it's still something you should think about but when you're looking at a computer that's been hacked into it wouldn't be that unusual for the rootkit for example to actually reset all the access times and all the files and stuff so it is possible that all this stuff all this information is lying to you but it's also very possible that they haven't bothered doing that and you'll be able to see this timeline of events of all the stuff that's happened on the computer you can also look at deleted files, as you guys know from the forensic side of things. So you can um, you can look at the the contents of the unallocated disk space and see whether there's there's you know stuff sitting in there like log files that have been deleted and things like that. So um, you know some of the software you might use is Autopsy, which, as I said, is free and open source software um, for forensics. It's a front end to Sleuth Kit, um, and uh, which is a collection of command line tools. There's also a web-based version of Autopsy in Kali Linux. Um, there's a newer desktop-based version in Windows, um, but we'll be using the, the Linux version that's available. Uh, and there's also Helix in, uh, Incident Response, which is um, a live CD and a set of tools that you can use um, for doing like memory analysis and all that sort of stuff. So it can do the online and offline stuff. Um, you can use it for... Um, on a Windows system to collect all the information from the RAM and everything like that, which is a task that you guys can do as um, for one of the labs. So that's the end of what I've got to say about <laughs> offline analysis. And as I said before, I really wanted to just give you a quick overview because you know you, you're going to go into that all that stuff in so much detail on the forensic side of things. But that just so you know, that's basically where the overlap happens. One the main one of the main overlaps between security and forensics is when you're trying to investigate and figure out what happened. Um, so, one of the lab tasks coming up, um, so like one of the lab topics coming up is hacker versus hacker. And basically that, so it's an entire lab sheet about this. Uh, and the idea is that you get to apply basically all the skills that you've learned in this module. Um, and the idea is that you will basically, you'll, you'll um, basically, Basically, you'll have a vulnerable system that you run, so um, it's uh, metasploitable, which as you know from DSL is a very vulnerable version of um, Linux that has all sorts of security problems in it. Um, and you're going to not defend it, but prepare yourself for reacting to it being attacked. And then you're going to attack a bunch of your classmates running systems and then turn back to your own and figure out what happened on it. And you know, you'll get um, marks for basically each of those steps. So um, in preparation for that, uh, you can set up any detection services you want. So on either on uh, Metasploitable 
or probably with a, another VM that you have running alongside it, like Kali Linux. So you might get Kali Linux, configure um, like Snort as, a, as an intrusion detection system so that you can detect that you're being hacked. You might want to um, look at, uh, like maybe you could set up remote logging so that instead of logging directly to this vulnerable system, you log across onto your um, Kali Linux system. Uh, you might uh, look at setting up integrity checking, so just grabbing a, um, getting the hashes off the Metasploitable first so that you've got something to compare it to after you've been hacked into to figure out what's changed. Um, and you know you might want to take a backup of the file system, something like that. <coughs> totally up to you guys what you want to do in preparation. You might, do, you might do no preparation at all. Uh, you're just going to possibly find less on the day. So um, what I recommend is that you guys do it in the lab time and you all actually turn up because it's a lot easier if you're all there at once. If you want to do it um, you know, in pairs or groups or even by yourself if you really need to, um, individually, then you can. But it will be a lot easier and more um, enjoyable if you guys do it together in the lab. So that's coming up um, either next week or the week after, depending on how um, something else works out that I'm currently trying to sort out for you guys for a class. We've got a um, one of the lecturers' websites got hacked into recently, and I'm trying to get permission to give you access to uh, to the evidence to have a look at, see see if you, what you can figure out. But I'm still negotiating that. Um, so, um, but one of the points for this task is you're not allowed to increase defensive security. So you're not allowed to like put in extra defenses and make it less vulnerable. The point of the exercise and I guess the module in general is to respond to the actual attack that's happening. So what will happen on the day is you basically you share your IP address with other people in the class. You'll exploit vulnerabilities. So you can just follow some uh, uh, tutorial or whatever if you need to and then modify some files, create some user accounts, and then figure out on your own system what happened using any of the techniques from the module. So find these, the attacker's IP address, figure, see if you can figure out how it was attacked and what modifications they made. Um, so in conclusion, incident response can involve dead, which is offline, analysis, uh, which is closely related to techniques used by forensic investigators, but the goals are different. We can use some specialist tools, which tie into the forensic modules, and um, Many of the previously discussed tools and techniques all apply once we get offline and we're doing our analysis. So you can see now where we were heading with this module and how it all sort of comes together and it all makes sense. All right, great. See you guys next week.